Internet, how are we doing? It is time for another Patreon review. This one is for the great producer of this very channel, Curtis Mason, who is having me review Wu-Tang, an American saga. And I gotta say, this show ain't nothing to fuck with. It is incredible. It is doing justice, one of the most influential, impactful, and important hip-hop groups of all time. It is reminding me of how much and how needed Wu-Tang was for hip-hop and how impactful they are to music till this day. It's also one of the best acted crime dramas I've ever seen. If you don't like hip-hop, there's plenty to get out of the crime drama side. If you don't like crime dramas, there's plenty to get out of the acting. If you don't like this style of show, well, we disagree and you're probably not watching this review anyway. I love this show. All of its critical accolades are well-deserved. All of its fan accolades are well-deserved. It is something I might have missed just by the sheer volume of television. And Curtis Mason was smart enough to go like, man, you will like this show. Commit to it. And having finished season one, this might be one of the best season ones I've seen of television. No asterisks, no category, no designation. One of the best season ones I've seen of television. So that is my spoiler-free thoughts. Uh, check it out on Hulu. Those are my broad strokes ideas. It's an hour long show. Each one is riveting. I'm watching, um, you know, about three episodes a month and that's about three hours of TV and I try to space them out because it's so good. I like to digest it. This is a show you can binge, but I would say not to. It's really good to let marinate. So I'm going to be doing the first four episodes of season two starting next month. So in April, I'm going to do four, May three, and then wrap up season two in June. And season three is about to get moving again. So we might go right into season three, which is the final season of Wu-Tang and American Saga. All right, that's all the spoiler free I can give you. Let's dive into spoilers. We're going to be doing episodes eight, nine, and 10. This is part three of the Wu-Tang review series. If you want to check out episodes one through four and five, six, and seven, these are these other videos right here in this very channel. It's all in a thread. Uh, dive into those as well because this is not going to make any sense otherwise. So starting with episode eight, I take notes between each episode and then dive on in. Let's dive into episode eight as I'm watching it. These are what I'm thinking. All right. Stoked to be back into this and to wrap season one. Curious how and where and when it ends. Curious how this persona has landed versus RZA. So at this point, we've just kind of developed the Prince Rakim persona. Uh, there was a bit of a time jump at the end of episode seven. So I was really curious how this all came together. Uh, <laughs> Armadillo, like Master Splinter, fucked one of those Ninja Turtles. Love, love, love how much they're making sure to incorporate all the comic book references because people know Wu-Tang uh, loved the influence of Kung Fu, but there's also, I mean, obviously it's Wu-Tang, that's what Wu-Tang is, uh, but there's also a ton of comic book references. There's a lot that RZA was into that shaped all of this and that evolved through the Wu-Tang sound. Um, that pizza cock block is amazing. Admittedly, Armadillo are weird as hell. Uh, cool to see Time Leap and Glow Up from Bobby's perspective. Wonder how long that lasts. Not very long. Uh, and the immediate new stresses and chaos of the road. Shit you cannot prepare for. Rakim versus Rakim. That whole conversation. And then that moment was such a beautiful moment about what it means to be Rakim. What that name means. That whole conversation. Uh, form like Voltron is obviously a reference to a few tracks and that made my my soul smile hearing these uh these little taglines and these little lines that obviously form into like the first time they say like an old dirty bastard those moments really it's like a, it's like a hip-hop easter egg it's like watching a marvel movie and seeing a character you know is going to be important it is so cool to see uh weirdly i believe in his manager's perspective so far but i can't tell if i should or not if he's nefarious or not i like it usually the the manager is so evil you can tell right away at this point i was like is this guy gonna fuck our boy over? And he, he did. Uh, that Jesus Walks needle drop in the studio after the meeting Naughty by Nature was incredible use of that song. Sometimes you bring a machete to the studio and then add Hennessy to the mix. That is sometimes how you make some music. Um, seeing Bobby's creative process shaping stuff is so rad. I love how they're handling that. Hell yeah, real shit encouragement from Q93 leading to the sound we do get with Wu-Tang leaning away from Prince. Uh, that whole different sound, uh, Prince Rakim. Uh, birth of Old Dirty Bastard in real time is beautiful. Little man freestyling, that was rad. The, the, the store owner's kid freestyling was adorable and that encouragement. And that's how new artists are made. Uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, shout out. I was born an hour from Greensboro, North Carolina in a town called Danville, Virginia, about an hour from the North Carolina border. Used to shop at the mall in Greensboro. 
I'm a Greensboro love in there. I was raised in Boston. I was born. I only lived there. I was only living in Virginia for like five years, but raised in Boston, born in Virginia. Uh, oof, that sample not clearing, changing everything, the beginning of the downfall throughout this entire episode. Uh, this is brutal. And now there's that management distrust. I am enjoying this line walking. Another time jump and Big Bro is back. Big Bro finally understanding the whole music situation is lovely because you see that bond between the two of them and how much it means to Bobby. More distrust. Producing is where it's at, but that wasn't in vogue at the time for artists to produce. And the director talking urban flavor. Oof. Uh, the director of the music video being like a white, white, white boy. And obviously, if you've seen the music video, which is really cool that they put at the end of this, um, definitely not Bobby Prince Rakim's style and sound. He said movie and then they gave him that. Yeah, didn't didn't get the sound, didn't, didn't get the vibe. Um, let the creative be creative, but I get the suits versus creative side. And I love that they're bringing that to the forefront in this show. That is a crime drama in its own way. The creative versus creative is a great, great dynamic and subplot. The gang starts coming together in this new world and setting. Love it. Well handled, Bobby. That was intense and an incredible wonder. Uh, wonder conflicting these two worlds. So um, there's this whole scene that takes place as a wonder. I don't want to give too much away. I don't know why you'd be watching this without knowing it. But uh, you've got Shameik Moore back in his periphery and back in his, his world. And you've also got the dude that understandably hates Shameik Moore's character. And this whole wonder walking through this set and the acting. There's, there's so much great work near the end of this episode. Damn, what an episode. Back to Brooklyn for V for part five. Uh, the birth of Wu-Tang Clan at the end of this episode. Oh shit, and the end of Prince Rakim. So glad they play the original video over the credits. You get the real life context that this all really happened, making it even more insane. The show is out in 11 and this is all real. So it's really incredible. All right, episode nine. Okay, less notes on this one. That last one was excessive. I wrote like hella notes. Uh, let's see how he does his rebuilding his way. God, the music escalating into some of the stuff I know more in the open makes me happy. What a character intro. Attila, that aptly named Beast, and he's our big bad for episodes 9 and 10. He's banging his best friend's sister. That's really fucked up. No wonder you love this movie. Little bro with the burns. That is that is painful. Wu-Tang Shaolin beef. Loving the parallels of pop culture to culture and those implications. Obviously, we hear it in Wu-Tang's music. It's really cool to see them developing that secret style and all the stuff involving it. The Shaolin versus Wu-Tang. And obviously that's what happens with Shaolin, which is uh, that area in New York and the Wu-Tang sound and those two rival gangs should make more. All of that stuff, beautifully done. A lot of Kung Fu movie influence as well as real life pop culture to culture. Uh, damn, you might want to accept the fact that you're not going to make it as a recording ar ar artist or producer. That was just a dark when his manager dropped and that was harsh. And there it is, Wu-Tang Clan ain't nothing to fuck with. We hear it for the first time. Uh, the drop by manager was brutal. Officially skeezy. I was believing too. I was hopeful. I loved that in the last episode. Attila is not messing around. Production design in this show is so solid. It's funny. I mentioned that. And then a few minutes later, they show how important it is. Get out of this life, dude. I hope that desperation goes that way, not death or jail. I know dude stories. I don't know dude story in real life. So when he mugs the guy for the fake Rolex on, you know, he, he ruined the drug Hustle. So like, he's just fucking up left and right. I'm hoping that desperation doesn't end up getting him killed. Uh, I don't know that dude in real life, like his story. So I actually love that I'm, I'm vague about a lot of the members outside of ODB, uh, RZA, like the core members. So I'm curious. Um, she makes video hype. Come on, Wu-Tang getting closer and closer. Secret Styles, Wu and Shaolin spelling out the mythology over a blunt, putting it all together, music and kung fu movies. Oh shit, they got Attila's attention. That's terrifying. You don't talk about money on the literal street. Uh, Supreme, 120 lessons. I need to look into that. So I love the perspective of what Riz has made from his art. I'd love to look into some of those concepts. Uh, rap is a spectator sport, rolls out weed. I love the idea, because that's true. If you're in the producing, like a lot of people like that, that energy. I uh, love the idea of rap as a spectator sport. I mean, battle rap obviously is, but even just producing or recording. Um, there's that production design coming to peak use in this house teardown. Attila just rips this house apart. And I was just talking about production design. Love the idyllic Bokeem Woodbine house for everyone out there in Idaho or whatnot. Uh, oh no, is she pregnant? Throwing up is never good in movies and TV. If a girl throws up, she's pregnant. And here we are. Uh, everything keeping Shaw from the booth that sucks over and over again. Oh man, Mr. Raid by seconds. First, I was upset for Shaw, like not getting to, you know, have his chance. And then immediately we see how quick things can turn. There's a full on raid and we learn that that cop was, well, that girl that he was crushing on was a cop. Learn about finances in those eight hours. Fuck yeah. We got our guy only working for two and he stuck there for 10. Eight hours learning, bettering himself. I love how we get some closure on that character. Corner office, lean back, beautiful. Uh, and then, the, yeah, that, that cop moment. 
Uh, 60G Ransom for all this shit. Oof, but how much that music means to him and how foundational it is. Uh, Secret Style, Activate. This whole martial arts recreation is incredible. And Climactic, Penultimate Ending in Episode 9. All right, heading into the final episode, Episode 10. Last episode of a devastatingly good Season 1. Let's get it, Wu-Tang. I want to see Wu-Tang form like Voltron. Wu-Tang tape enters the party, loving the OG Def Jam love. Guys, if you look back at like Def Jam when it was first starting, even like through some of the mid-90s, so consistent. Def Jam is formative for hip-hop. If you like rap music, hip-hop music, Def Jam is insane consistency, especially in the beginning. Um, just I love, I love the love shown there. And yeah, uh, Beastie Boys, you know, making all that money really did help them make a lot of risks, which really did inform a lot of new sounds, which is impactful still today. I'm not as big on the last few years of hip hop since, you know, Migos had a really, that beat that's so overused now. They, I don't blame Migos, but also the Mumblecore stuff, the SoundCloud stuff. Like I listen, I'm a lyric hip hop guy. So this Def Jam and that Eminem wave, all those three waves, I really think helped the sound that I like most. So, so what Wu-Tang did with lyricism value, what... Beastie Boys did that allowed so many risks to be taken. Um, and then the artists that came out of that Beast Boys risk time and then Eminem, uh, I think are really formative to the stuff that's today that I dig. Anyway, love this girl, love this producer. What a badass. This gun thing is gonna come back to bite somebody. Build slash destroy scene was incredible. What's the mathematics of today? That entire sequence was so good. Of course he kept a copy for himself. We first hear Seventh Chambers. This whole episode is scored by one of Wu-Tang's biggest songs and its formation. This might be the last copy. Now there's three. So the last copy of that track might have been because it got stolen. So that, that one the, the producer has and smartly removed Wu-Tang off it. it. Might be the last copy, but now there's three. It's going around. Rifkin gets it. Seeing Seventh Chambers be recorded is dope. Wondering where it's being played right now in story and right now in life. I was thinking about it in while watching it in 2022, but also wondering where it's spreading. And we do see a couple times where it's out in the street already. Tanya is such a badass. Bokeem and Mama Bear are precious. Love that idyllic family again. Oh shit, she's back on a bus to New York City. She is. Uh, control the rollout and the crowd opinion. Lemonade from Lemons. She's already a better manager than anyone we've seen. We're literally getting her crowdsourcing, but because of time jumps, we don't know when this is, which I dig. Competitive, but as one group. Wu-Tang. Shaolin, Wu-Tang, secret style. Shameek and his mom bombing over music in church against all odds is a beautiful scene. Written on the cereal box. Shameek more rapping, holding a cereal box, not having paper. So much. I could do a whole video on that. That is beautiful, beautiful detail work. Even in the background of shots, Bobby is so, so good. The actor that plays Bobby, even in the background, just his movements, his charisma, his energy. That kid is incredible. I want to see him everywhere. Uh, Italian mafioso dude still has Bobby's mom's back. And that's a smart place in public, but protected. So not quite in public to meet up with that beast. Italian mafioso dude. Always great to see that guy pop up. Shit, and dude still got robbed by Attila. What is his move next? Bobby versus Attila just straight up says he's got to take him out. Divine finally getting back to it. Why and how? And then again, the time jumps playing with that chronology. Love the time playing this up. Time crazy with manager. Has she been managing this this long or is she lying to people? She says a couple months publicly, even longer, not publicly. We don't know when Tommy's going around doing this stuff, which is really fun. Or at least I didn't know. Um... Finally, finally, Bobby going all the way, his the way at the end of season one, which is where Wu-Tang's going to spring up because it's his sound, his way. Oh, the Shuri pop in right then. So much tension. Adding in the phone and the knocking, all the tension for the finale and the pregnancy drop. What's he going to do with the pregnancy? We do see it goes very positively, but we got phone ringing. We got knocking. We got three scenes going simultaneously, tying up a lot of loose ends. All crescendoing. Tension, tension, tension. Oh shit, dude dropped him in broad daylight, but couldn't finish the job. That's a big dude. How does Bobby Rizzo survive that monster? Obviously, I don't know who Attila is in real life, so I don't know what happens from here, and I love that. I thought about researching, but I was like, nah, I'm gonna let the show teach me, and then I'm gonna do my research at the end of three seasons. I don't wanna know too much, because this show's real, so I don't wanna effectively just be a prequel to now. I wanna learn, like, through the show, and then research Attila and shit. So I assume that dude lives just fine, because he's a big dude. Um... All the catharsis in multiple relationships all coming to a head. Love that dude's learning. Love the, the them all being on the bus. Uh, back with her to Ohio and Bobby to let the heat die down. He escapes Attila. He's manning up. Everyone's maturing. Love how they're handling that at the end. And he got his shit back. So we get to see him rebuild his way. Steve Rifkin trying to make good but still sketchy. And what a fantastic first season and origin stop point for season one. All right, I've been trying to keep these videos 
under 17 minutes because that seems to be the sweet spot for people actually watching them. If the video is like as long as episodic TV, people generally don't fuck with it. So uh, I love this show. Curtis Mason, thank you for being a producer. Thank you for being a sponsored patron of reviews and suggesting the show. I love it so, so very much. Anyone watching this, if you're a fan of hip hop, I highly recommend Wu-Tang. If you're a fan of crime dramas, like I said at the beginning, this is that as well. And if you just want to know about a formative group in rap, this is a really informative and great dramatization of a scary thing that is probably terrifyingly accurate. It's also weirdly topical because the world hasn't evolved nearly enough in 40, 30, 30 years. We'll say 30 years. Um, incredible show. Love it so much. Wu-Tang and American Saga, one of the best first seasons I've ever seen, one of the best crime dramas I've ever seen. It happens to be a stuff I love very much. Uh, Curtis Mason, thank you, thank you. Anyone watching this video, thank you, thank you. If you like this sort of thing, share it. Uh, like, comment, follow me. I'm trying to do more things like this. I'm trying to grow this YouTube channel. Uh, any of my patrons, thank you very, very much. I am next doing more My Hero Academia, wrapping out season four for the great John Getz. If you're watching this before Oscar Sunday, I teamed up with AJ Lancaster to do an Oscar prediction. And if you're watching it after, you can see how we did. Either No matter when you're watching this, check out what the show for our Oscar predictions. So uh, lots of good stuff coming at you. And if you're watching this before April 30th, and you're in LA, I'm going to be doing the Morbius premiere, uh, running it, running around at it. If you're around, go to it. It's going to be rad. Um, Cinemark's doing it. So lots of stuff coming from me. Follow me on TikTok for stuff over there. Check me out on The Real Rejects for a Moon Knight coverage. Trying to be everywhere, y'all. Check out The Big Thing every week. We're doing rewatches. Check out Schmodown. Got like 10 things right now. Very tired. But Wu-Tang, it's keeping me going because Wu-Tang is for the people. All right. And Wu-Tang is for the children. God, this show's so fucking good. Uh, Curtis, you're right. You're right, man. And I'm gonna do four episodes as you recommended to kick off April. So we're gonna kick off season two, four eps in April, probably near the end of the month. Much love, y'all. Expect some My Hero Academia coverage probably next week. And uh, keep an eye out for all my Morbius stuff, all my Moon Knight stuff, all my Doctor Strange stuff ramping up. That Thor trailer's coming soon and Schmodown and the big thing and everything else I can't tell you yet. All right, much love. We'll see you soon. Bye.